and uh, house finches that we would typically see. What a lot of people are beginning to realize and are reading about is the fact that the colors of these males are actually acquired while the bird is molting. And uh, the color is derived from pigmentation in the food sources that these males are feeding on. What's kind of cool about all of this too is that females tend to prefer males that are more vibrantly colored, the red, the red of males. And scientifically, they believe that the um, females are focusing on these colors with the tendency to um, uh, believe that the brightly colored red males are a better um, result of producing food or finding food for the young and caring for the young as well as the female herself. Um, the uh, habitat that these birds generally frequent are um, out in the Western areas are chaparral uh, and desert uh, grasslands, but they will also occupy farms, city parks, backyards, uh, suburban and, sub and urban areas uh, in the middle of towns and villages. It's amazing just how widely dispersed and highly variable uh, these birds are in their habitat selection types. Um, when it comes to uh, their diet, it's 97% uh, based on food. So they will eat seeds, uh, predominantly seeds, buds, and the fruit of different types of plants. What is unusual too about these birds is that unlike many songbirds that would feed their young insect material, they actually would feed their young regurgitated seeds. In the photograph on the lower left, um, they have been known to frustrate hummingbirds quite a bit because they will challenge the hummingbird for the sugar nectar that hummingbirds rely heavily on. And you can see in that photo uh, that male house finch is uh, basically trying to deny uh, one very upset hummingbird from uh, getting to its sugar water uh, nectar. Again, unlike so many other uh, small uh, finches, they do uh, spend quite a bit of time feeding on plant material. Only about 3% of the food is made up of uh, animal matter. And that is only when uh, that animal matter is in high number or high availability. Uh, when they do take a small insect matter, it's generally uh, on the size of aphids. Okay, the, the, males, uh, the males generally start nesting um, or, or start courting in March. And uh, they spend the winter months in very, very large flocks. These are very gregarious birds, but once uh, March rolls around throughout most of their range, that is when the males will establish uh, their very small territories. They will sing to attract females, but if you guys remember quite often with uh, songbirds, the uh, songs have a dual purpose. Uh, the song attracts available females, but it also functions to tell males this territory is occupied, stay away. Once uh, courtship begins, the males will actually uh, feed the females at times during courtship as part of the whole bond uh, bonding ritual. And uh, once that is established, the female and the male will go about um, making the nest, although the female is the one that does most of the nest construction. Two to six eggs are laid on average. The eggs are, are blue, can vary anywhere from blue to off-white. It would generally dark purple or black spots towards the large end of the, uh, the eggs. Incubation is solely done by the female for about uh, 13 to 15 days. Uh, the males quite often will feed the female while she's incubating. Uh, but then the rest of the time he spends um, guarding the nest. Any males attempting to invade that uh, territory, he attacks those males viciously to drive them away. Unlike other species that focus on a very large territory, the male tends to only focus on that area within the, the uh, site 
of the nest. Um, once the eggs hatch after that 13 to 15 day period, the male participates in with the female in caring for the young and feeding the young. Again, instead of utilizing uh, insects as most songbirds do, they actually will feed their young regurgitated seeds um, uh, to, to nurture the young. And at that time, there's usually enough uh, plant protein around to compensate for the young uh, in their ability to develop uh, strong bones and for growth as well. Um, uh, I wanna take a moment just to read a little bit of a, um, a conservation uh, note here. It says here, house finches are common and with the exception of some areas in Western North America, their populations appear to have increased between 1966 and 2015, according to the North American Breeding Bird Survey. Partners in Flight estimates a global population of 40 million birds with 76% in the United States, 21% in Mexico, and 3% in Canada. The species rates at six out of 20 on the continental concern scale. The house finch is not on the 2016 state of North America's birds watch list. These birds generally benefit from human development. However, populations underwent a steep decline beginning in January, 1994, owing to a disease called conjunctivitis. The disease causes respiratory problems and red swollen eyes, making them susceptible to predators and adverse weather. House finch conjunctivitis was first observed at feeders in Washington, DC area. It's not harmful to humans, but it has spread rapidly throughout the Eastern uh, house finch population and into the West as well. One of the, uh, one cool uh, bit of information about these birds is that uh, they were introduced from San Francisco to Oahu in about 1870. And by 1901, they spread throughout most of the Hawaiian islands. So they're extremely pro prolific, highly adaptable to whatever habitats are available to them. And they're an absolutely beautiful bird to see. Uh, I have had reports from other birders that are beginning to see them occasionally in South Florida as well. Um, uh, in closing, I just wanna mention that if you guys are interested in sending requests for uh, the continuation of our Bird of the Month through next year, please go ahead and send your request as it is noted at the bottom of this slide to pinockbom at gmail.com. And if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and send them through the chat to Scott and he will forward those questions to me. Okay, so uh, if you have questions for Clive, thank you so much, Clive. That was uh, a great presentation on, I know what people in the, up in the North consider a very common bird, but down here it is, much less common for us to see. Uh, and we have some questions starting to come in. This is from Mary Ann Gable, actually one of our, our new board members I was elected this evening. Clive, how might you differentiate a house finch from a purple finch? I thought someone might ask that question. <laughs> the, the purple finch actually has purplish stripes on the flank, uh, the sides of the birds and um, on the head as well. The female uh, purple finch actually has uh, a slight eye ring, whereas the female house finch doesn't. So uh, those two field marks are your distinguishing features that will help you to identify and differentiate your house finch from the purple finch. But both of those species are very, very close in uh, plumage. So uh, if you're within a location where both uh, species overlap within the range. You wanna make sure that you look for those uh, ID field marks um, to determine what you're actually looking at. Okay, thank you, Clive. And that's, yeah, and I, I know that I have been in those areas up north when I, when I uh, summer up, up in upstate New York and I've seen both together and they're yep. hard to pull apart. So uh, there's no other questions, although 
Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one other question. Uh, this is from Lauren Butcher, another uh, board member that has been elected uh, for a new term. Uh, Clyde, did you come across any information about how people can help prevent spread of house finch conjunctivitis by avoiding uh, certain feeders? Actually, it, it is believed, uh, based on the scientific information that I've read through, it is actually believed that it is more common in the Eastern population of the house finches due to the fact that uh, they were all produced from the numbers, the small numbers of house finches that were uh, released on Long Island. They believe that it is more focused on the, that particular group of birds because they're more closely knit and did not have the genetic diversibility as the uh, Western population does. So because it started from that group, it was more infected or highly contagious amongst that group. The scientific literature also states that it takes on average about three years for the disease to run its course before the population of house finches begin to recover from that as well. Um, as I mentioned before, it is not contagious to people and uh, it seems to be able to uh, counteract itself over time uh, just through natural uh, sources. So um, there's not anything in particular that we as birders can do to my knowledge, to counteract it. It just needs to run its course. Uh, one more comment. Uh, this is from Ann Wiley. Uh, I've had them at my feeders for about six years now. Uh, this morning, watch the dad regurgitate seed for his full grown youngster. Looked like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and, and just like it is with some parent, with some humans, kids just don't know when to quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, oh, one more question. Uh, uh, do they migrate fly? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the northern uh, regions, um, it is, it's been discovered that females are the ones that tend to migrate south, whereas uh, the uh, males tend to hold to the um, uh, regions that is typical for them during the rest of the year. So what we will find in the southern regions where uh, the birds uh, inhabit, there's an influx of females during the winter months and a minimum of females during, the, uh, during that same period up north. And then once spring rolls around, the female part of the population begins to increase again. And that is how uh, scientists have been able to determine that the females are the ones that migrate uh, south during the uh, non-breeding season. Wow. That's great information. Thank you, Clive. You're so uh, if, you need, if you want to send a bird request to Clive, uh, there are his emails on the bottom of the shared screen that you all are looking at. Uh, so be sure to get that down uh, or do a, take, a, take a screenshot of the page. Clive, CC, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. We look forward to the surprise bird of the month next month. Uh, all right. can't, wait, can't wait to find out what it is. Okay. Thank you, Clive. You're welcome. Thank you, you're welcome. Okay, everyone, so now uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quickly and we're gonna to get to our feature presentation. I'm very excited. I just see it for some reason. All right, so um, uh, let me introduce our featured speaker, uh, the child of Cuban immigrants. Ron McGill was born in New York City, uh, but moved to South Florida at the age of 12, which was around the age when he realized that he wanted to work with animals. His favorite show as a child was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, which I suspect some of you might remember with its host, Marlon Perkins. But do you remember the man in the field who had all the cool animal adventures? Well, um, Ron does. That man in the field was Jim Fowler, who inspired Ron at a young age and who would later become his mentor. Uh, Ron's first job was working at the Miami Serpent, Serpentarium, which no longer exists. That name was too hard to pronounce anyway. In 1980, he became a zookeeper at Miami Metro Zoo and gradually became head zookeeper, senior zookeeper, and then assistant curator. 
Today, Ron is the Communications and Media Relations Director at the renamed Miami-Dade Zoological Park and Gardens, or Zoo Miami. But Ron is equally known for his appearances on television shows, shows such as Good Morning America and The Today Show. He also appeared for over 25 years on the iconic Spanish variety program, Sabadu Giganti, and I'm probably saying that horribly. Until the show ended its over 50 year run in 2015. He, was a, he has a regular segment, segment on the Don Libertard show with Stugatz, where listeners can call in and ask him questions. He has also appeared on several documentaries for the, Dis, for the Discovery Channel and the History Channel, and during the 1980s, handled many of the animals used on the Miami Vice television shows. Ron is an imposing man, standing six feet, six inches, and sports a signature mustache, which he seems to have had throughout all his adult years, at least on every photo I could find of Ron, he had that mustache. Something I can relate to, by the way. Uh, the first time I saw Ron was on television about 15 years ago, when he appeared with a Komodo dragon on The Late Show with David Letterman. I can still visualize David Letterman losing it really losing it when Ron put the Komodo dragon on his desk. Uh, Ron has been working with animals for 41 years and has been to Africa over 50 times. He has been bitten by hundreds of animals, including crocodiles on multiple occasions. Ironically, on one of those occasions, one of those occasions turned out to be fortuitous as Ron would meet a physical therapist who would later become his wife. Ron has raised millions of dollars through the Ron McGill Conservation Endowment at the Zoo Miami Foundation. The endowment provides money to other conservation organizations around the world to protect wildlife in the field where they are found. He has also worked with several children's charities, especially the Make-A-Wish Foundation, where he helps to grant wishes for children facing life-threatening diseases. While Ron is best known for his ability to captivate an audience with his tales about animals, he is also a Nikon ambassador and knows how to tell a story with a camera. Tonight, get ready to see both of Ron's talents on display. Now, please feel free to extend your arms out a bit and applaud in your living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, or wherever you are watching this Zoom cast from, as Audubon Everglades welcomes Ron McGill with his program, The Harpy Eagle Project, Panama. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate it. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Let's do the share screen here. There yes. It is. Boom. Okay, share. And there's my project. Okay, now let's see if we can do this right. Okay, do this slide like this. And then we go down here and we go into the play, I guess, is what we're going to do because it's a. Does that look like right? Does it work? Looks okay. great, on. Perfect, okay, so listen, as Audubon people, you know, we are primarily birders, though I realize we care about the environment all around us, not just birds, but uh, when you talk about birds, for me, uh, there is no more iconic bird than the harpy eagle. And ironically, I grew up in a small apartment in New York City before moving to, to Florida, and I never had seen a harpy eagle. My first harpy eagle, for those of you that may have been to New York, was at the Museum of Natural History in New York, one of the greatest natural history museums I've ever been to. And I remember seeing a mount of a harpy eagle right next to the mount of a bald eagle, our national bird, which at that time I thought the bald eagle was the, the end all. That was it. That was the mega bird until I saw a harpy eagle standing to it next to it and it looked like a pigeon. So I said to myself, my gosh, is this bird really exist? But I'd never gotten to see one until I married my wife, who's of Panamanian descent, and I went down to Panama. And in Panama, you know, this is a long time. This is probably 30 years ago. Panama City, you can't even see those buildings anymore. There's so many big buildings surrounding it. But Panama is this incredible metropolis that is literally right outside of a rainforest. It has a great amount of, amount of culture that you see throughout the city, whether it be the little buses, um, but it's best known for the Panama Canal. Uh, this is a picture I took on the last day before the American flag, flag was lowered and the canal was turned over to the Panamanians. The canal is an amazing feat of engineering, not as big as people think. I mean, there's portions of the canal where you think you can throw a rock across it, but it is the economic engine of Panama, everything from cruise ships to tugboats to little boats go through. Basically, it's a flooded lake. You see the remnants of some of the trees there flooded in the area. But what makes the canal so incredible to me is what surrounds it. 
these incredible tropical forests that are absolutely stunning. No matter where you go in these forests, my goodness, it's like, it's a dream for me. I, I, you know, coming out of an apartment building in New York City, moving down to, to Florida, then going into these forests, it's like, wow, geez, everything I ever imagined. You see all these different layers of life, the emergent trees coming out, these stunning, beautiful vistas of animals, the water, and it's not just birds. You know, you have the classic birds, the great blue herons, the, the limpkins, you know, the, and hingas. You have a, uh, some of the herons, a little tiger heron juvenile there. You also have a lot of reptiles, a lot of other animals. Uh, you know, in Hinga, there were the turtle. Uh, you have different types of crocodiles. There's a, a caiman, there's the uh, crocodile, there's small crocodiles, there's bigger crocodiles, there's really, really big crocodiles. It is just a plethora of wildlife surrounding that canal. And it's just, again, those forests. Now, those forests really aren't there because everybody thinks they're beautiful and they want to be saved. They're there because those forests provide the sponge that brings the water to that canal, which again is the economic engine. You cut down those forests, you lose the sponge that absorbs the water, and you also lose the roots that keep that soil from constantly falling into the canal and requires more dredging than is already needed. But when you look at these forests, my goodness, it's like, you know, you, the movie Gorillas in the Mist, you see the mist in the forest, these beautiful areas, no matter where you go, these great little tributaries that go through the back ends of them, the flowering trees at a certain time, the jacarandas and such, my gosh, it is unbelievable the diversity you see in these forests, and everything is growing up, everything is growing towards the sun, you see, I call it the green cathedral, I mean, really, for me, you know, I, I, I have great respect for religion, but to me, this is church, Churches being inside these forests looking up, this is something truly that was uh, the most magnificent place you could be. You look at some of these buttress roots in these trees and people don't realize the size of some of these trees, the magnitude of these trees, unless you put in some size for perspective. As Scott was telling you, I'm six foot six, I'm not a small guy, but I can disappear inside some of these buttress roots of some of these trees, these trees that are hundreds of years old. You know, when you touch a tree like that, you're, you're connecting to, to centuries of growth that is going on. This is a tree that was over 50 feet from one end of the buttress to the other, just a huge, huge tree, uh, you know, told, by, told to me that it started growing before Columbus even discovered the, the new world. So you see all the lianas, you see the diversity of these lianas coming down, the shapes, the sizes. You know, when you're walking through a tropical forest, you don't understand that it's not like walking through a deciduous forest in the Northeast where, you know, if you lose your balance, you put your hand up against the bark of an oak tree or some other uh, deciduous tree in the forest, it's not a problem. You can't really do that in a tropical forest because the tropical forest, these trees are loaded with spines to protect themselves from just that kind of, uh, of damage or being fed on. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. You're overwhelmed by the greenness, but you see these great splashes of color, these little flowers that emit out of nowhere, all kinds of different things, a passion vine. You know, thing, I don't even know what this stuff is. It's just, it's so beautiful, so diverse that I have to photograph it as I walking through the forest because this is the home of the harpy eagle. This is a plant called sweet lips. For those of you that are old enough, you remember in our, I remember I, my mom had it in our house, uh, a drug called Ipecac. Ipecac is what you used if uh, your child swallowed something toxic and you needed to, for them to vomit it up. You gave them Ipecac. Well, Ipecac comes from this flower, uh, the sweet lips. So it's great to see all these things, you know, and, and again, these huge trees that really don't have a bare spot on them. Something grows on top of something, on top of something, on top of something. It's constant mosses, ferns, everything growing in these forests. And again, everything is growing up. The sun is the energy, is the light. The diversity of orchids that grow in Panama, holy geez, I couldn't believe it. I'm just photographing so many different types of shapes, colors, sizes. Throughout the forest, you see these orchids just blooming everywhere. And it's really quite amazing to see that. You know, I try to tell people, you look at the diversity of things like the haliconias, you know, you'll see where a tree has fallen in the forest and all of a sudden you see hundreds of these haliconias. Gosh, I pay like 10 bucks a stem for these things in the florist when I want to give one to my wife. But what I try to tell people is, listen, look beyond the big. You know, if you look closely at these things, like a haliconia flora, you see there's so many different layers of life. When you look closely at it, you look, see, there's just other things living on that flower. There's another world when we talk about the macro world. You, you, you're going to see a presentation, I guess, coming up in a future presentation on macro photography. This is a great world for me. It's what I find to see so many fascinating things in the forest. We're always looking for the jaguar, the anaconda, the taper, the harpy eagle. And we walk by these great little magnificent marvels that I think uh, really Really don't get as much credit as they deserve. You know, look at the, these types of mantis. My goodness, look at the wings on this animal. It's exactly like a dead leaf. The camouflage is unbelievable. It's mind blowing to look at that. So it's great to see this diversity. And I try to encourage people, you know, don't walk by all these things. Take the time, you know, that old saying, take the time to smell the flowers. Well, take the time to look at the insects, look at the invertebrates, look at all the different things.
this is a cicada here. I know the Northeast is about to uh, experience the big 17 year cicada emergence. So it's gonna be a, quite a little natural phenomenon up in the Northeast United States. But these cicadas in a tropical forest, you know, people have this vision of a tropical forest. They watch something like Snow White and they've visioned this little butterfly flitting around and just little tweeting birds. And it's a beautiful little sound. Couldn't be any further from the truth. You get into a healthy tropical forest and Lord have mercy. It's just like, it's an overwhelming sound of things like these cicadas. Okay, what's going to happen here? Why am I not able to advance my slide? Something happened here? I'm trying to advance my slide. Okay, we'll do it that way. And look at little things like these frogs on the bottom. These are leaf little frogs. They're tiny little frogs. You don't realize how tiny they are until you hold it up and again, put it in perspective. That's a full grown leaf litter frog. So again, the life in these forests is so diverse. The poison dart frogs, the red eyed tree frogs, goodness gracious, the Panamanian golden frog. I hiked up a mountain for two days in pouring rain to find this frog to, to photograph it. It's an endemic frog. It's only found on a couple of small mountainsides in Panama, but it really has become a symbol for all the, uh, you know, the, the, the amphibian crisis with the chytrid fungus that's going across uh, uh, frogs around the world right now. If I want to find small boas, I have learned to look for stands of haliconia flowers. Why? Because the boas learn that the hummingbirds come to those flowers and they'll just wait there for hummingbirds to come get the nectar from the flowers and they grab the hummingbirds. It's pretty incredible to watch uh, how these animals have adapted. Uh, things like the basilisk lizard, uh, bats, my gosh, there's so many bats. You know, bats are the most numer numerous mammals in the rainforest, all different kinds of bats. Look at the way they camouflage. When you look at them against the bark of a tree, these bats disappear. It's amazing. It's just, it's, it's so for me, it never gets old. These are tent bats where they go underneath palm fronds and they chew the fibers on the palm fronds so the palm frond bends over like a tent to protect them. It's really phenomenal to watch. Of course, the bird life is phenomenal. Got the self-abreasted toucan or the, the uh, keelbill toucan. Um, you know, a beautiful bird, but not a very beautiful sound. Go, hey! very loud throughout the forest, pretty easy to find when you see them in the Arasaris. Um, again, what I do is I usually find a tree like a, um, uh, this is a, um, gosh, I'm going blank, but it's fruiting right now. It's Cecropia tree. It's a Cecropia tree that's fruiting. And, you know, when I see one of those trees fruiting, I just set myself there in a blind and the animals just come to trees like that. The hummingbirds, Lord have mercy. These are the jewels of the forest. It is incredible to watch how they go through the forest and, 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 and you know, how they get their name, that hummingbird. And the diversity of them. I mean, for every one of these photographs I get that's in focus, there are 20 that are not in focus as I try to capture them in the air doing their flight. Uh, but it's just such a great challenge. And again, the diversity, the beauty of it. There, there's no end to what you see in these forests, all the different kinds of birds, again, feeding on these fruiting trees. I always tell people when you want to photograph wildlife in a place like this, don't try to chase the wildlife. Plant yourself in a place that is attractive to wildlife, whether it be a water hole, whether it be a fruiting tree. Here we have a uh, Great Curacao male there. Uh, here we have a, a snail kite, uh, very, very numerous on the Panama, Panama Canal. You see many, many of them uh, with that great adaptable beak to get those snails. Uh, the king vulture, one of the most spectacular vultures in the world, again, found in Panama. And then you start focusing on the birds so much that you lose track of everything else. Like I'm looking, I don't even, I think this is some kind of burial or something. I'm not sure what it is. But if you look back in that little fuzzy thing in the background there, what is that? It's a sloth. And they're also in the trees. And this is something that's really incredible. Now, the reason why the sloth is incredible is because in Panama, the sloth is the number one prey species for the harpy eagle. And that's what this talk is about. It's about the harpy eagle, what it feeds on, its world, and the program that I came up with to protect it and inspire others to protect it. This is the uh, agouti here. This is a peccary here. This is a kawata mundi. These are all mammals of the forest. The largest mammal of the Western Hemisphere tropical forest is the tapir, uh, you know, distant relative of the rhino and the horse. Um, very sought after food by the indigenous people there. Here's an adult, the babies look like little watermelons. They're absolutely precious uh, in, the, in the forest. Um, the little Joffrey's marmoset, again, feeding on the fruits in the Cercopia tree. I just planted myself there and all of a sudden these animals just came to me and I just started just photographing them as they're doing their thing. They pretty much kind of noticed me, but I just stayed to stay quiet. I use a mirrorless camera, so it doesn't make any shutter sound when I'm photographing them. And it's just fantastic. The white-faced capuchins, people tend to look at these animals and think, oh my goodness, they're so cute. I want to have one. Look how beautiful that animal looks. Listen, folks, never mess with any kind of primate, any wild primate at all, especially things like capuchin monkeys. Um, these animals, you should never feed them. Unfortunately, a lot of people, even in tropical America, they tend to always feed them, trying to habituate them to food, and that's when they become dangerous. I try to remind people that primates play a very important role in the forest, 
But if you're going to try to treat them like a pet, understand they're like dirty little people that bite. And uh, you need to be very careful when, when working around them. They have very substantial canines. And I know I have seen personally some of the incredible injuries that they have inflicted on people who thought that they were quote unquote cute. Um, spider monkeys, red spider monkey, black spider monkey, the howler monkeys. Man, when you go in the forest, the home of the harpy eagle, when you hear that, just it is phenomenal to be in a forest and listen to howler monkeys in these forests. It's just unbelievable. This is another very favorite prey of the harpy eagle. You see them with their babies. You see them going through the canopy feeding. It's just an incredible thing to see. But this is what we're here to talk about. In my opinion, the single most amazing bird on the face of this planet. People will look at an image like this and they say, it looks like an owl. I think it's an owl because it has that great facial disc. The reason it has that disc is because this is a canopy predator. And in the canopy, it's very thick. So in addition to good eyesight, they need very good hearing. The same reason an owl has a facial disc, that facial disc on a harpy eagle is able to concentrate sound, just like a parabola microphone on a football sideline in an NFL game is able to collect that sound into the microphone. That dish acts as the collector for the sound. When the bird is not alert or alarmed, that crest is down. It doesn't look very much like anything. It's just like a regular eagle, massive beak, but just a regular eagle. When it hears something, all of a sudden that crest goes up. And when that crest goes up, it creates that facial disc. It looks right at you and it concentrates that sound. You'll see it bobbing its head back and forth, kind of trying to tri triangulate the sound to locate its, its prey. Largest talons of any bird on the face of the planet as far as birds of prey, flying birds of prey. These talons are larger than the size of, of grizzly bear claws. I have personally seen a harpy eagle take out a full-grown sloth at about 100 feet up in the canopy at flying at about 50 miles an hour and never stopping. They hit that, that uh, sloth with such power, such force with the back talon. Many times they break the spine, immediately incapacitate the bird. And I see them continuing, uh, incapacitate the sloth, and I see them continue to fly without losing a beat. It's unbelievable the power. It is believed that they are the strongest bird of prey on earth. This was a very bittersweet moment for me because these are the first two harpy eagles I ever saw alive. And they were in a horrible little cage in a little zoo in, outside of Panama City. And I went in there and I saw this and it was bittersweet because here I am seeing my first harpy eagles, these beautiful majestic birds kept in this horrific little cage. I mean, the cage was just so God awful. Uh, the perches were terrible, everything was terrible. And I said to myself, my goodness, I have to do something about this. So my knee jerk reaction was I went to the director, I said, who, is, who, who runs the funding for this? Somebody has to build a better facility for these birds. And he told me what the mayor does. And, uh, you know, so I said, okay, I'm going to write a letter to the mayor. People laughed at me. I said, well, you never know. You can write a letter. So I wrote a letter and the mayor contacted me and invited me to breakfast. And I had breakfast with her. And I said, Miss Mayor, I, I, we cannot continue to have these birds like this. this is horrific. This is just a, 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 just a horrible situation for these majestic animals. And she said, Ron, you know, I totally understand and agree with your perception of that being a bad situation for those birds, but I'm the mayor of Panama City. And I have to take care of potholes, pick up garbage, take care of people in trouble. If I start allocating money that we really don't have to make a better bird cage, I will be crucified by the voters. And you know what? I understood a point. She was right. So I asked her, I said, Miss Mayor, can you please give me the power to go out and try to raise some money and see what I can do to try to make a better place for these birds? Nobody in Panama even knew what a harpy eagle was. As a matter of fact, they thought the bald eagle was their national bird because of the U.S. presence there on the bases. And they saw the bald eagle and so many of the logos of the U.S. Uh, officers. They thought the bald eagle was their national bird. It wasn't, they didn't have a national bird. So I said, let me go out and try to raise some money. And what I did was I then made a meeting with the ambassador to the United States, the US ambassador to the US, this is a long time ago, but I met with the US ambassador and I asked him, I said, Mr. Ambassador, I need to get a list of everybody, all the major corporations that are doing business in Panama uh, and doing business throughout Latin America based in Panama. He gave me the list and I wrote letters to everybody asking them to support a project for conservation for the Harpy Eagle. I received a call from Sony Corporation. And this is the big Sony Corporation. They said they were very interested in helping me. They had uh, turned a new leaf. They wanted to get into an environmental cause. So they wanted me to give a presentation to the president of Sony Corporation, Mr. Akahigo Kaji. He was gonna fly in from Tokyo and he was gonna meet me in Panama City where I could do a presentation to see how that went. Well, I got all flustered. I said, oh my God, this is great. But then I got all nervous. I'm saying, I'm gonna to present to the president of Sony. He's gonna fly in with some of his vice presidents. I need. I need some bang with my buck. As Scott told you in the beginning, my hero growing up was a gentleman named Jim Fowler from Wild Kingdom. Uh, to make a long story short, about 35 years ago, I got to meet Jim Fowler and he soon became not only a great personal friend, but he became my mentor. 
he taught me how to present animals, how to be a communicator. Uh, you know, when I knew him, he was immensely famous, world renowned for Wild Kingdom. Uh, I met him actually doing a world tour uh, throughout the country. Um, presenting animals and he would call zoos in whatever city he was in to ask them if they could bring animals so he didn't have to stress animals out by flying them from city to city. Well, I called Jim up, I go, Jim, because Jim was the first person to ever actually work and raise a harpy eagle. He uh, is an incredible aviculturist and, and, and just an incredible expert, especially with birds of prey. He's a master falconer, a master bird. So he was wonderful. I said, Jim, you're famous. I need you to come with me down to Panama. So when I present to the Japanese, they're going to look at you and say, oh, that's Jim Fowler. This must be an important guy. So we're going to give him some money. Jim says, oh, happy to do it, Ron. So he came down. So Jim came down with me. That's Jim right there and me back at the Harpy Eagle exhibit uh, many, many years ago, back, back in 1989, 1990. And here we are getting ready for me to present to Mr. Agahigo Kaji. And I gave a very passionate presentation. I'm kind of an animated guy, you know, and I told him, this is why you got to protect this bird. I said, listen, you know, when you talk about conservation, you have to you have to pick species that can serve as an umbrella species. You know, sometimes it's very hard. Like here in South Florida, you know, if I go to somebody, I say, listen, we got to start a conservation program for the Key Largo wood rat. 90% of the people are going to look at me and go, it's a rat. You know, it's hard to explain the importance of every species to just the layperson. So you need to come up with an animal that people can relate to, they can be inspired by. And by protecting that animal as an umbrella species, you protect everything that lives under that animal's uh, environment. And that's what the harpy eagle does so well, because to protect the harpy eagle, you have to have you know, many, 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 many thousands of acres of undisturbed tropical forest. And in that undisturbed tropical forest is where you have many other species. So I did this presentation and Mr. Kaji didn't even smile. He and his vice presidents looked at me like they were so stern. I go, oh my goodness, we're not gonna get anything out of this. He goes off, he goes, oh, I'm going to discuss with my vice presidents now. And he walks out of the room. I look at Jim. I go, Jim, we're not going to get anything. The guy would look like he was in a coma to me. He says, Ron, you gave a good presentation. I understand the Japanese are very smart business people. They don't like to wear their emotions on their sleeves. They don't like to show their hand. Uh, you, you might be surprised at what he says when he comes back. Well, believe it or not, he came back. He said, you give a very good presentation. We're going to begin by giving you $250,000. So I was in shock. Uh, to make another long story short, they ended up giving me almost a million dollars in goods and services and money, and we were able to officially kick off the Harpy Eagle program in Panama. To do that, and with any conservation program, you need to engage the local people who live with these animals side by side. I don't care how good a scientist you are. I don't care how much great data you pick up. I don't care any graphs and all the charts you can present. If you don't get the people who live with these animals to care about these animals and want to protect these animals, all your research and all your work is going to be for naught the minute you leave your, your destination there. I knew that unless I get the indigenous people of Panama to care about them, this bird as part of their heritage, to take pride in it as part of their heritage, it was not going to be a successful project. I work with people like the Kuna Indians, but the most um, impactful group of Indians that I work with were the the, the, the tropical forest Indians, the Chocos, the Emberá, the Wunan. These are the people who knew about the harp eagle as part of their, their background. I went and visited them deep in the forest in their villages. I got to meet with the chief. This is the chief there. This man is 80 years old. If you look at his feet, you see how they curl around? Those feet curl around because that man can climb a tree better than any primate you've ever seen in your life. I watch him at 80, literally pick tree with his feet, grab the, the tree trunk and climb a tree. This is his son, the um, chief in training, who'll be the next chief. Look at the children out there, see the families playing in the water. I mean, this life is such a healthy life. And when you see a smile, let me tell you something, folks. A smile is a smile is a smile. When kids smile, it's a great thing. And it just transcends any language. So I got to, to learn about these folks' culture, how they live in their villages, the things they do, how they celebrate, the dancing, the food. I met different chiefs and different tribes. You know, I'm six foot six, but rainforest indigenous people, generally speaking, are fairly short. Um, and you can see these guys standing next to me to give you an idea that, you know, they looked at me like I was a freak. I mean, they thought, oh, my God, you know, King Kong has come into the into the forest here. So it was kind of an interesting um, dynamic when I walked in to meet these folks, but they immediately took to me, were incredibly kind. I went out with them fishing in their, their dugout canoes. Sometimes I almost sunk their dugout canoes because I'm such a big guy, but these guys were ripped. They went out and it's just, it's such an incredible experience to, to learn about and experience these forests through their eyes. You know, folks, many of them don't know how to read or write, uh, don't have any formal education, but I will tell you this, most of them have forgotten more about the forest than any of us will ever learn. 
And these are things we have to understand when we work in these places, how they live, prepare for the floods, the cooking that goes on, the different crafts that they do, the baskets. These are the women. They were so fascinated by me, they all wanted to take a picture. But here's a story about how conservation really pays bigger dividends down the road. I became very close to this village. And I would go back year after year and doing my studies with the harpy eagle, getting to know them. They would tell me where the nests are. They would take me to these nests. It was incredible. So I watched these people grow up. And here I am 20 years later with the same tribe, with little girls that I saw in the beginning, like this little baby right here, taken in 1980. And here she is in 19, uh, 1998. This is the second girl here from the left. Same little baby. So you watch these kids grow up. You watch them develop. It's really an incredible experience. I would find these nests, give them a GPS locator to find the nest. I chartered a helicopter and I'd go out to find the nest. This is a research that we wanted to do. I would fly into these incredible forests, drop down into the forest from the helicopter, just rappel down. But in flying in, I saw this also. You see these pockets of deforestation. You know, this is not being done by bad people. This is being done by farmers who are just trying to survive. These are not bad people, uh, but they need to survive. And they think the only way to do that is to cut down these trees so they can plant their crops, even though their crops after two years can't be planted anymore because the soil doesn't have much nutrient in it and it just kind of leaches away. This is the gentleman with his family living in the forest. Those are his daughters and his wife. They're never gonna, they're never gonna be able to go to school. Well, never is a big word, but in their present lifestyle, they're not gonna be able to go to school. They're gonna have to live off the land. These girls are this man's life. So you cannot blame him if the only thing he knows to do is to cut down that forest to plant crops so he can feed his family. So our job is to try to give them alternatives, teach them alternatives. And that's what we did. What we did was that, that farmer that you saw there who was one of the farmers cutting down some of the forest, we trained him to guide people to harpy eagle nests. Now you as birders, as Audubon people know that uh, there's probably more than one person who has a harpy eagle on their life list to see in the wild. And this gentleman learned that very quickly. He became an experienced and revered guide, bringing people to see the harpy eagle in the forest. And he is nonstop guiding people to see harpy eagles in Panama. And people are beyond excited when they're able to see that animal and check it off their life list. This is my team that we went to research to hike down to find this eagle. Um, I look at that guy's belly and I said to myself, how is this guy going to lead me through the forest? Well, let me tell you something. That belly is all muscle because that guy ran circles around me. It's incredible how fit that they look, even though uh, they are, even though they don't look that, that, that fit. The forest, again, is beautiful. We trekked through these forests. I couldn't believe that these indigenous people were barefoot, walking through all these spines and thorns. It's unbelievable. We finally got to the tree. We noticed it was a tree because on all the leaf on the bottom, you see all the guano from the birds from the top of the nest. You cannot see the nest because it's over 100 feet high on the top of the canopy. The canopy is very thick, but we knew this was the tree. So we used a modified crossbow and a, a rope that we shot up there with, a, with that crossbow. And then I climbed up that rope all the way to see if in fact that nest was occupied. Our gut feeling was that it was because of all the guano we saw on the bottom. And as we go up, you know, you see all the different layers going up in the forest. It's like a big apartment building, folks. Each, each floor has different occupants going all the way up. It's so diverse. But I got to the top, I looked to my right and I see this canopy. This is over, this is about 124 feet up, according to my altimeter. And you're at the top of this tree and it's swaying back and forth, but the canopy is so thick, you feel you can walk over it, it's fantastic. But what was even more fantastic is when I looked to my left and in the nest of the harpy eagle was a harpy eagle chick. And for me, folks, I got to tell you, I've been very blessed in my life. I've, you know, I've tracked tigers in India. I've put radio collars on lions in the Serengeti. I've gone swimming with killer whales in the Galapagos. I've tracked polar bears in the Arctic. But the single greatest wildlife moment in my life was when I got up into the nest of this bird and I got to see a harpy eagle chick. This was about a 10 week old chick in the nest just looking at me. It's one of those moments that photograph is framed in my office as the single greatest wildlife moment of my life. Being in this pristine forest at that time, I was one of only a handful of people that actually climbed into the nest of a harpy eagle to examine the chick. Um, this is my partner, Raphael. We had a, a mobilize a chick. So we grabbed it to immediately wrap its talons up and um, a Spanish, so we don't have any big danger there. They don't really do anything with their beaks. This is the mother out on the limb looking at us and she was she was calling, she was giving us some alarm calls, but she never came at us, she just watched us. Again, harpy eagles are not used to any kind of predator coming up to a nest. So this was probably something that was quite confusing to her. We set a trap to catch one of the adults 
And in doing so, we also took all of the remnants that we found in the nest. It was our objective to find out what were these harpies feeding on. So by getting the skeletal remains and hairs and things like that that we saw in the nest, we realized that 95% of their diet was sloths. You can see the sloth skulls, you can see the sloth skull, uh, uh, claws. They were also taking some birds, they were also taking some agoutis, but generally speaking, it was sloths that they were feeding on. So we set the trap for the adult, and as soon as that adult flew in, we pulled the line and we caught him. And then my partner went up because this guy has much more uh, courage than I do. I'm not going to ride up a rope uh, with one hand and with another hand, try to grab a harpy eagle that with one grab of a talon could sever the tendons in all of my hands in one shot. But he is a master at this. Raphael is one of the greatest bird of prey people I've ever seen in my life. He went up, grabbed that bird, incapacitated the talons with, uh, with Ace Bandage, and we brought the bird down to take all the data. We collected blood. We took measurements. Uh, we fit it with a backpack to put on a special satellite transmitter that has a a solar battery on the back and transmits to a NASA satellite. So once we put this transmitter on the bird, I could come back home to Miami and I could go onto my computer and I can see exactly where that bird is in the forest. We can find out the range of the bird. We can uh, then use that data to show how much habitat it needs uh, in order to, to, to survive and thrive. Uh, again, one of the greatest moments right before I was able to release this bird, um, what I did was a uh, uh, took the bandages off, gave it to Raphael. We took all the measurements, took all the data. Again, this bird just kind of looked at us, never tried to peck at us or anything like that, because it was just kind of like, and it wasn't in shock. We took its vitals. It was not totally stressed out or anything. It was just kind of like confused. And then finally we released the bird and it was great to see, you know, these birds go back to their nest and care for their chicks. It was just an amazing feeling. I've done that on several occasions. And then we built the largest harpy eagle center in the world in Panama, thanks to Sony Corporation, and then I got other, other corporations to jump on board. Once Sony jumped on board, people like Visa International, American Airlines, they all jumped on board. And we built the single greatest uh, center for harpy eagles in Panama, had all kinds of internal museum displays showing the history of the bird, uh, the cultural heritage, and how it, it connected to every Panamanian and why they should be proud of it. Uh, Sony donated all kinds of audiovisual equipment. We did had a film made, Neil Reddick, one of the great National Geographic filmmakers, made a special film just for this exhibit for me that he donated. Um, the aviary became a huge aviary. It was close to 100 feet tall in the back and uh, it was 100 feet uh, deep and 80 feet wide and the birds could fly free. There were two levels where you could watch it. When we had the grand opening, every VIP in Panama came down to see this bird uh, be introduced to the new exhibit. They, they nest builded. They had natural trees growing in the exhibit. You saw them flying in the exhibit, nest building. This was such a rewarding feeling. It was incredible. And then what happened was it was such a success that became got tremendous publicity. I worked with the media. I got a, pre, a, a, a letter from President Clinton. Uh, back then, uh, Bill Clinton was the president congratulating me uh, on this effort that he had heard from the, the uh, ambassador, U.S. ambassador, what a success it was and how proud uh, that you know he was of a U.S. citizen doing all this work in Panama. I then got a call from the president of Panama, President Ernesto Bayadares at the time. Uh, he's a Harvard educated person, so he spoke perfect English, though I speak, I also speak Spanish. Um, and, he's, and he called me, you know, I don't know, I never imagined I would ever get a call from the president of the Republic, but he called to say that this was a great project and that he wanted to do what he could to make it a better project. He wanted to thank me on behalf of the country for, you know, doing this thing from a grassroots effort to develop now what was become a national phenomenon, this bird. I said, Mr. President, you know what I'd like you to do? I'd like you to have a contest for all the school children in Panama to paint a harpy eagle and to write an essay on why the harpy eagle is important to them. And then I want you as the president to pick out your favorite painting and make it the next national postage stamp of the Republic of Panama. And people kind of frowned at me when I said I was gonna do that, but the president loved the idea. He made a series of four, we picked four uh, winners. And these are the, some of the drawings that were made, the national stamps. And we did a release with these national stamps and it connected kids to this bird. Everybody knew about this bird. That's the mayor there in the center. She was a phenomenal lady. She just was so supportive of this whole project and really made things happen. Uh, this is me with harpy eagles that I worked with down in Panama that I helped hand raise that we use as ambassadors in the schools. Just the most impressive, most amazing bird you could ever imagine. Then we had a harpy eagle hatch out at Zoo Miami. And we are only, we're the only zoo in the country now that is hatching harpy eagles. And what I did was when that bird hatched out, I told the management, I said, we need to name that bird Panama in honor of this incredible relationship we've had with this country or with its people. And we did, we named it Panama. And then when the old bird that had been down in Panama for 40 years passed away, we decided to bring this bird down. Uh, once it reached uh, somewhat of a juvenile adulthood there, um, 
we brought that bird down, look at the talons, and we decided we were going to bring it to Panama. So we caught it up, and here it is getting its pre-physical exam. It wasn't very happy, but uh, this bird didn't realize that it was going to become the single most celebrated animal in all of Panama. I didn't even realize it at the time. I worked closely with American Airlines, who was one of my sponsors. This was the time American Airlines had just changed their logo. And I was privileged to take this bird on the first plane that had been painted with that new logo. It was brought into Miami specifically for this. It was going to be the, uh, you know, the, the chauffeur, the limousine for this bird to go to Panama. I personally loaded the bird up in a special air conditioned compartment just for that bird. And I went to Panama. And folks, there's no way I can effectively describe to you what it was like when I got off that plane in Panama. You would have thought I was Kim Kardashian. I was mobbed by the press. I didn't realize the mayor's office has sent down these invitations to all the VIPs. Sony sent out invitations to all the VIPs saying Panama was coming to Panama. This was like a huge, this was like when they brought the pandas from China to Washington. It was such a huge thing. And when I got off that plane, folks, I was mobbed by the media. It's like nothing I'd ever seen before. They all wanted to know what was happening. Uh, not just local media, but national, international media was all there to hear about this incredible project and how this bird was so eagerly awaited in Panama. I did all the national uh, morning shows talking about the bird, talking about Panama, talking about why this bird was important. It was a movement. They gave me a key to the city, was given to me by the US ambassador and the mayor of Panama City. I couldn't believe it. And then the day came when we were releasing that bird into the new aviary and everybody who was anybody in Panama was all lined up to see this. And when that bird came out and flew up to that aviary on the top branch of that top perch, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you people cried. People got emotional. It was such an emotional thing to see how proud they were of this, this bird that had become the symbol of their, of their wildlife. Not only that, the next day in the paper, it was front page news in every newspaper in the country. Everywhere you look, it was like this huge movement. Oh my gosh, this bird is here. We've got to protect the bird. Kids got so involved. We had coloring books made of the harpy eagle. I, I wrote cover stories in conservation magazines about the harpy eagle. It was just an incredible onslaught of just information about this magnificent bird. And all of a sudden, people who didn't know anything about the harpy eagle knew about it. In fact, Panama then made a national harpy eagle day. It's called Festiat Pia once a year in April. As a matter of fact, this month, it's National Harpy Eagle Day where they have thousands of people come to the Harpy Eagle Center and they celebrate the bird. They have all these uh, presentations by the wildlife police who now change their logo to the Harpy Eagle. They have you know, people like Smithsonian. They have Audubon. Audubon Panama is huge down there. Working with all these people, getting the kids to, to work with these, uh, you know, with other kids and get them in, uh, you know, inspired about this magnificent bird. That's a horrible mascot. We're doing a new mascot. That mascot, that, the guy who made that didn't do a very good job. It looks like a blow up doll. But anyway, we're getting a new mascot. But the fact is they made a mascot, you know, kids made harpy eagle cookies. They made harpy eagle cakes and they were proud of it. They were so very proud. The people did dances. They did folklore dances about the harpy eagle. It was amazing to see kids would have harpy eagle dress up contests that became these national contests, how a kid could dress up like a harpy eagle. But this next image to me as I conclude the program, is the one that really hit home. You know, there's an old saying that says, we have not inherited this earth from our parents, we're borrowing it from our children. Because my wife is Panamanian, my children have Panamanian blood running through them. And for that reason alone, um, I am so proud to have done this project because this is part of their heritage. They have ha Panamanian descent, and I wanted to make them understand that their dad was trying to do as much as he could to save this beauty of this forest through the eyes of this bird. And it really hit home to me because in this next image, this image was sent to me by one of the, the journalists who covered the event of the opening. This little girl came up to me and she literally had tears in her eyes and she held her hand and she looked at me and she goes, I wanna thank you for protecting our national bird. I wanna thank you so that when I grow up and have my children, they'll be able to see it. I'm telling you folks, there's no greater feeling in the world than having that kind of impact on a child. It really is no greater feeling in the world. And for me, it all culminated on April 3rd, no, April 10th, 2003, when I stood in front of the Panamanian Congress and I watched them pass a law officially designating the Harpy Eagle as the national bird of the Republic of Panama. And now you will see the Harpy Eagle on all the badges, on all the crests, on everything. I modeled it after our Bald Eagle uh, program here. And now when you go to Panama, everybody, knows what the harpy eagle is and they're proud of it and they're doing everything they possibly can 
to protect it. So that's the end of my program. I hope you're able to get something out of it. I'm sorry I went so quickly, but I know you kind of went over time here and I didn't want to keep you guys too late. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. I'm sure Ron will be uh, happy to answer them. Um, and we do have some both comments and questions already. So let me get, let me start shooting them at you, Ron. Uh, Susan Young said, amazing photography and great presentation. Uh, Janice Fadden said, these pictures are amazing. Uh, in regards to the pictures, Jay Richard asked, what mirrorless camera and lens do you use? I use a Z6 II, uh, Nikon Z6 II, and my favorite lens now is the Nikkor 200 to 500 5 6. I know it's not as fast as I like it to be, but it enables me to handhold that lens all the time. I just, in the situations that I'm in, I don't have the time to set up a tripod, things like that. I have to be able to aim and shoot flying birds, blah, blah, blah. So that, that combination works best for me. I have the battery pack, it allows me to shoot 12 frames a second, and uh, it enables me to get some great shots with a silent shutter which is phenomenal because as you guys know, that clicking sometimes can be somewhat disturbing when you're trying to get birds in a natural behavior. Wow, great photography. Um, uh, uh, also, um, how is the pop, this is uh, Jackie Sulik uh, from Audubon, Florida who joined us this evening. How is the population of harpy eagles doing? I had a chance to see one in Panama, but it was a major effort to get in to see the nest. Yes, it is a major effort. And you know what, that's a good thing. Um, because we don't want to make it so easy that people go in there because these are birds that can be very easily disturbed by human traffic within a forest. Having said that, we don't really know um, how the population is doing, but we do know this. The surveys that we did in Panama, the nests are closer to each other than any other country in the Western Hemisphere, which indicates to us that there is a really good prey base within the Panamanian tropical forest, that the, that the, the, you know, the uh, population is dense enough that they can keep those nests fairly close to each other and still have enough forest to provide enough food without any conflict in those forests. So Panama, Guyana, and Venezuela are the last three strong countries for harpy eagles. Wow. Great, great information. Um, uh, Elwood, Elwood Bracey says, I saw mine, I, uh, referring to the harpy eagle, in Manu National Park in Peru, and it caused monkeys to drop out of the trees, very dramatic. How many square miles of habitat does it take to support one such eagle? You know, nobody knows exactly because it depends on what country you're in. Like in Panama, you know, we know it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 square miles. But you go to a place, uh, you know, like Colombia, they need like 40 square miles. Uh, so it, these things depend on the density and the health of the forest itself. Uh, but yeah, that phenomenon he saw is a wonderful instinct, especially with squirrel monkeys. As soon as they see a harpy, they literally let go and drop to the floor because harpies rarely come to the floor. However, now in Brazil, they're finding that harpies are coming down to eat armadillos. So they're wow. adapting. They're adapting. They'll actually be found on the fringe of the tropical forest and going down into the crop fields to get armadillos, which is something fantastic. Hmm. Uh, Gay, Kay Gates says, I also visited the Harpy Eagle Center with Claudine Labs, our former president of Audubon Everglades in 2009. We stayed in several different areas, including Echo Lodge. When was the last time Ron saw the center? She's, uh, how is the center doing today? You know, it's doing okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I need some, some upgrading, some, some, some paint and stuff, but it's doing very well. As far as the people visiting it, my gosh, it gets visited all the time. It's just a matter of the financial upkeep. You know, when you take care of a building that's air conditioned and paint in a tropical humid climate like Panama, it's constant with changing the metal cables, with changing the paint and such. So I'm constantly raising money to keep that upkeep, but it's doing very well uh, in, in respect to that. Uh, so uh, m most of the uh, rest are, oh, oh here's, a, here's another question. Uh, what are the harpy eagles in captivity being fed? We feed them rats and rabbits. Uh, in captivity and they're fed whole whole animals uh, dead they don't kill them we we humanely euthanize the animals and they're fed dead but the entire animal it's important that they get all the hair the bones everything okay so get ready for the compliments uh deb devers love this uh marcia abrams thank you great presentation lauren butcher incredible thank you uh, Fredolin evans thank you for the great program helen scott lawrence fantastic presentation thanks so much 
Lillian Maniscalco, Maniscalco, wow, fabulous presentation. Thank you, Blue Kaufman, this was spectacular. Thank you, Nancy Freeman, awesome presentation and great photos. Maxine Schreiber, terrific program, love your enthusiasm. Florette Braun, wonderful to hear about Ron's amazing success with this project, well done. Serena Rinker, thank you, Ron, great presentation. Kathy Aubach, I am new to birding and my friend from Scotland told me about the harpy eagle, so I signed up for this program. This is my, his, his favorite bird. I am, I am crying, this is so unbelievable. Thank you so much, this is amazing. Ann Miller, awesome, thank you so much. Uh, uh, oh, here's a, I've, I just saw another question. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, I, I read that already. Sabina Begg, fantastic program, Ron. Thank you for all your wonderful work. That, uh, uh, that many uh, for many generations will uh, that many generations will benefit from. Uh, 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 Emma M. Uh, Emma M. Yeah, is Sony still funding this project? Yes, they do. They still fund this project every year, which is something that they've been doing it now since 1990. It's an incredible uh -huh. company that has given a lot. Uh, and Wiley says, I am reading the exhibit at closing time at your Harpy Eagle enclosure about 10 years ago. I man came up to me and asked if I'd like to help with the feeding. So I went into the enclosure with them and fed the eagles a huge dead rat. Wow, it was a fantastic <laughs> aviary. Uh, I, yes, uh, Marianne Gable, you're quite a remarkable person. Do you have another? Do you have another passion project? Um, you know, my my passion project really is. Um, creating, you know, keep building on this conservation endowment that I built at the zoo, because you know what, you know, you guys, I really appreciate all the wonderful compliments, but it's you all that really deserve all the compliments because people like the volunteers in Audubon, when you get together and you exchange this knowledge and you help inspire others, you guys really are the ambassadors that help, uh, help this new generation, especially understand the value of protecting our wildlife, that we are all inextricably connected. Uh, so you all inspire me. I'm very fortunate to be on the board for Audubon, Florida. Uh, I am always moved by what I see in volunteers like yourselves and chapters like Audubon Everglades, what you guys do, the fact that you get together, that you can have 50 plus people on a Zoom call on a Thursday or Tuesday night doing what you do and getting people to listen. That's inspiring to me. You know, this is part of my job, even though I always make it, you know, my vocation is my avocation. This is something I can't believe I get paid to do. But those of you who don't get paid to do what you do and still do it because you love to do it, you are the real heroes. You guys, you know, I, I just, I did a present, I did this presentation, as a matter of fact, just now for the fundraiser for the uh, Bird of Prey Center, the Audubon Bird of Prey Center in Maitland. And through my endowment, I was able to, to present them with a $10,000 check because those volunteers, what you do when you're saving birds, when you do things like Eagle Watch, all these things, you're, you're saving, you're saving animals for future generations and you're connecting people to those animals. You know, I, I work at a zoo, folks, but let me tell you this. I didn't come to work at a zoo to work for an attraction. I came to work at the zoo 41 years ago to work for a place that's making a difference in conservation. Was it not, were it not for the endowment that I've been able to establish there and, and, and help support things like Audubon and other conservation in the field, I wouldn't be at the zoo any longer. I never ever support taking an animal out of the wild and putting it in captivity, unless it's a last ditch effort to save that particular animal or to save the species it represents. And we've been able to do that. Good accredited zoos have done that, whether it be the Arabian Oryx, whether it be the black-footed ferret, whether it be the California condor, had it not been for zoos, those animals would be extinct and that would be tragic. But again, that should be the only reason we ever take an animal out of the wild when it's a last ditch effort to save it. I don't believe in taking animals out of the wild strictly to put them on exhibit. Uh, I, I don't go for the argument either. Well, we need new bloodline to keep the healthy populations. But you know what? Immobilize an animal in the wild, collect the sperm and do artificial insemination. You can insert the bloodline without taking the animal out of the wild. We need to do more of that. And zoos that spend multi-million dollars on new exhibits need to be, they need to be required to leave a significant part of that budget to protecting the animal they're gonna put on exhibit in the wild. Because if the zoo is the last place that we can safely see these animals, then we as zoos have been epic failures. And that is my goal. My goal is to make people understand that, make my zoo understand that. I think we do a good job, but we can do a better job. And that endowment gives me credibility. It gives me, it validates what I do and being able to connect with people like yourselves and see the excitement and see people, you know, fall in love with an animal. You know, there's that old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love. We love what we understand and we understand what we're taught. 
That's got to be a major mission of zoos to teach people to understand the magnificence of wildlife, the diversity of wildlife, and how it's all part of a link in the chain that makes life better for all of us. So my thanks goes to all of you for what you do. Well, thank you so much, Ron, and thank you for, say, for, for saying all those things. Um, a couple of more questions. Uh, <laughs> do you take people on Harpy Eagle tours in Panama? Ron Ra Rich Raphael, who was assisting me on this Zoom meeting, uh, <laughs> wants to know. I don't, but uh, you know, you can get, you can call like a An Ancon, uh, Ancon Expeditions in Panama. It's one of the best touring groups for nature in Panama, and they can arrange that for you. Uh, there's a place in Panama for birders that I am very good friends with the founder. As a matter of fact, I stayed on the first night it opened. It's a place called Canopy Tower. Look it up. Google Canopy Tower in Panama. It's a birder's paradise, and they can arrange for a way for you to see the harpy eagle. Great. And um, a question from Kathy Hansen, our, 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 our recording secretary. I lived in Miami when Hurricane Andrew destroyed the aviary at the zoo. Has the aviary been replaced? Oh, absolutely. It was replaced years ago with an aviary that's many, many times better and stronger, uh, you know, withstood all of the ones subsequent to Andrew, you know, Wilma and all those other ones. And it's thriving. As a matter of fact, you know, we have several first breedings in that aviary. Uh, if you're ever in town and you're a birder, you want to go in there. It's about six to 700 birds of about 85 different species, all from Southeast Asia. And I, I've seen it. And it's wonderful, by the way. Uh, Ann Wiley says, totally agree with what you said earlier, Ron, right on. Uh, Kay Gates to everyone, yay. Uh, Jay Richard, this was amazing. Uh, Deborah Smith, what a beautiful country. Thank you. And that is the end of our questions and comments, Ron. That was an amazing presentation. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate you giving us your valuable time, uh, coming to our chapter meeting and doing this amazing presentation. Thank you well, so I, much. I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. And uh, thank you again for all that you guys do. Have a wonderful evening. Get some good night's rest and enjoy the upcoming weekend. OK, thank you, Ron. Take care. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Great. Worth, worth the applause. Uh, just, just thank a you. Now, um, let me just uh, try to share my screen again. I haven't been too successful tonight. Uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. Okay, um, so you'll see uh, next Tuesday, uh, next month uh, on Tuesday, May 4th is our next monthly meeting at 7 p.m. Again, it is Richard Moirod, manager of Audubon Island Sanctuary Projects in the Lake Worth Lagoon. Learn more about what's going on right in our back door doorstep at the Audubon Island Sanctuary. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, Richard Moirod has spoken before about native plants. He is an expert on that as well. Uh, so we'll see you next Tuesday, May 4th. In the meantime, enjoy your birding. It's spring. There's lots out there. Birds are singing. Birds are nesting. Uh, it's a great time to be outdoors. By the way, Peaceful Waters has a rough. So if you've never seen a rough, get out there really quickly because it's still there. Have a great evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. See you on May 4th. Good night, everyone. <laughs>